There we go. Perfect. Hey, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jim Kerr. He's going to talk to us about what to expect with this next round of ECF. Um, and for those of you guys that are new to the process, he'll kind of go over some basics and introduce what the program is. I will, we want this to be really interactive, so I'm going to monitor the chat and Q&A. So if you have any questions, he'll run through his presentation and then we'll spend some time answering questions. So just throw them into the Q&A or the chat and I will uh, run them over to Jim. So with that, I'll let you get started, Jim. Okay, thanks, Anne. Um, okay, the, the Zoom version, share screen, there we go. Perfect. Good morning. Um, so we're gonna do a discussion of round three and kind of set the stage for why we have a round three emergency connectivity fund funding window or filing window and, uh, and go from there, kind of just um, recap of what's available within the emergency connectivity fund, some best practices and a recap of overall of federal funding, some of which is still readily available and it has not been spent. So um, without further ado, we're gonna head into the discussion. Um, so let's do the screen slide deck here. So, um, so COVID stimulus funding summary, um, there are tons and tons of, of money available or have been available over the last couple of years. And we started off with the, um, uh, the ESSER funds, elementary and secondary school emergency relief from the CARES Act and the Continuing Resolution Act, and then the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, totaling just billions upon billions of dollars. Um, we did a quick calculation on, you know, back of napkin stuff and came up with somewhere around $5,000 per K-12 student in the United States at 50 plus million students. So again, a bunch of money out there. A lot of it is allocated for technology and distance learning applications and to uh, bridge the homework gap uh, or um, digital divide. <clears throat> so here we are, uh, the latest one with the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Originally, there was $7.17 billion in that fund. The latest stimulus package that was passed recently um, had an additional $300 million. So we're up to about $7.5 billion. And this next round of funding that we're looking at is uh, associated with the leftovers from that of about $1 billion. Um, the final number is not in yet, so we don't know. Um, we're guessing with the $300 million and the approximately $1 billion, it's gonna be in the $1.2 billion range when all is said and done. They're still um, filing or funding applications, so we don't have a true appreciation for what applications are actually gonna utilize, which folks turn back money that don't utilize it, that sort of thing, which applications will be denied. So that's still getting completed. And again, the final number isn't in. So what is the American Rescue Plan Act Emergency Connectivity Fund? It's to reimburse 100% of the costs associated with eligible equipment, advanced telecommunication and information services or eligible equipment, advanced telecommunication services. And basically what it means is to um, meet the unmet needs of students, teachers and library patrons that don't have access to good telecommunications and internet access. Um, so the latest news. Uh, a while ago, they extended the service delivery for rounds one and two, and that is until June 30th of 2023. So if you haven't utilized that funding yet or haven't gotten the services, because obviously some of the hardware is not readily available due to supply chain issues, um, they've extended that service delivery. Um, now they've announced this round three for purchases, four purchases made between July 1, 2022 and December 31st, 2023. So they're even sliding the window out further for the delivery of this stuff. <clears throat> the application window opens in a couple of weeks. So April 28th and closes on May 13th of 2022, a 15-day window. So um, you have a few weeks to get your ducks in a row. And I would highly recommend that you apply early and apply often. Um, that's the mantra of E-Rate, and we're suggesting it again for ECF. Make sure that your applications are completed in a timely fashion, and this is a first in, first out. So the longer you wait to file, the less likely it is that you will see any kind of funding commitment decision in a near term. 
The earlier you file, the more likely you'll see a decision early on in the process. The same basic rules and application format, and when I say the same basic rules, they're pretty much identical other than the timing, and the application format will remain the same. Uh, approximately $1 billion available, and this is important, um, particularly as you plan for the future. If there are not enough dollars, then the E-rate discount percentages will kick in, so make sure you allow for that in your budget calculations. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> so some of the highlights, school buses are eligible for Wi-Fi access on school buses. Students, school staff, and library patrons are eligible to receive services. Let me go back to school buses. Um, if your school buses are very um, uh, urban in, in use, and there is lots of Wi-Fi access on the school bus already, i.e. students can fire up a cell phone and use it while they're on their school buses, there's going to be a tough um, road for you to prove that it's meeting an unmet need. However, if 50% of your students are rural students and they're riding a bus for an hour and a half a day, each you know, round trip and that sort of thing, uh, i.e. very rural or um, very impoverished areas where um, it's been proven that um, you know, there are right side and wrong side of track types of situations where internet service providers um, and Wi-Fi wi providers what cellular providers are not providing the same quality of service in um, poorer areas than, than wealthier areas, um, when we know this to be true, then, then you may have a case. So it's not for physical security so that you can have, you know, cameras on the buses or anything like that. This is for student unmet need. Um, student, school staff, and library patrons are eligible to receive the services, again, as long as there's an unmet need. What is unmet need. It is beauty is in the eye of the beholder oftentimes. This is where you get to determine what you consider to be unmet need. That can be through a parental survey. Do you have access at home? Is the access good? Can you engage in a um, distance learning um, scenario? Um, can all the children in your family access the internet on a distance learning application simultaneously? Those kinds of questions and where there, there is an unmet need, then this kicks in. There is no cybersecurity eligibility, although CIPA requires, or there is a CIPA requirement if you're providing both the device and the connectivity, then there is a requirement for CIPA compliance. Um, no minimum bandwidth requirements, as long as it can actually do the job of uh, engaging in a distance learning application. For students who are in need, again, that unmet need, if the applicant has purchased using federal dollars from another source, you can't use this one. So again, if you purchase through um, ESSER funds or some other emergency relief funding, you can't use this application. And then, but if it came out of the general funds, or let's say you did 50% with ESSER and 50% general funds, you could apply for the general funds component of this with using, utilizing this funding source. The 471 application process um, remains basically the same, and it's bear or spy invoicing. You get to choose at the point in time where you submit your application. So again, know what you want to do and how you want to do it. Work with your service provider to determine what that's going to look like down the road. Um, if you can afford to purchase out of pocket and then wait for the funding uh, commitment decision letter to come through, then go bear. Um, that will um, ensure that you get this stuff at, earlier in the process. If you have to wait, then you have to wait for your funding commitment decision letter. Then you can file and get funding at that point. Then you're talking about spy invoicing. And again, no competitive bidding requirements. You get to select who it is, although um, there is what is called the boundaries of good taste. I would highly recommend that you do some sort of analysis that says this is not a bad deal. Um, so process. Applicants and service providers must register in the System for Award Management. It's at sam.gov for payments. So you must have registered within the ECF portal, within the E-rate portal. You must have registered there and also with sam.gov for the payments. Um, determine needs for students and patrons with need. And no competitive bidding required, but you must follow state and local procurement laws for your particular locale during the acquisition process. 
And then again, contracts for services delivered between July, 21, July 1, 2021 and June 30th, 2022 for this is round one discussion. Now that is July 1, 2021, or excuse me, 2022 through June, uh, December 30th, 2023 for this one. And then uh, the Form 471 ECF portal during the 15 day window is going to open up at the end of this month. The goal is for 50% of applications funded within 60 days of window close. Didn't happen, but again, it's a nice goal to shoot for. And then no applications will be processed until after the window is closed and total dollars of all applications has been determined. This is gonna be particularly important with only um, in the first round, there was about seven or excuse me, about $6 billion applied for um, or excuse me, $5 billion applied for in the first round, um, approximately $1 billion in the second round, remaining $1 billion to apply for in this third round. Um, so it's likely that the, most of the funds will be utilized, and that's why I make note of the D-rate percentages for discounts kicking in, and we'll discuss that in another slide. Um, then again, bear and spy invoicing. The invoice will open X days after the 471 window closes. We don't know what that looks like yet. Again, it depends on the calculations. And then you can file a bear prior to payment and receiving services in order to afford the solution. Um, in other words, if you um, have a funding commitment decision letter in your hand and you have not um, made a payment to your service provider, you can go ahead and order the equipment and receive the services and go ahead and pay your service provider and then file a bear. And, and again, you can do that about 30 days ahead of actually receiving the services. So prepayment. Um, the process for awards. If demand exceeds availability, then awards will be based on the E-rate category one discount percentages with a twist. So if you're at a 95% or 90 discount on your category one, Rural applicants get an additional 5% discount. So they're going to be at 95% discount, 5% payment, 95% uh, paid by the ECF program. And then if demand exceeds funds for availability for a specific discount group, then the applicants with the highest percentage of low-income students will be funded first. So again, um, you know, don't uh, the 50% discount districts and applicants. Um, I don't, you know, I don't mean to be a naysayer, but um, I, I would say apply, but be prepared for a disappointment, honestly. Um, what is and isn't eligible? So again, school buses are eligible, cybersecurity not, cell phones are not eligible, but a wireless data plan on a Wi-Fi hotspot, for instance, would be eligible. Fixed broadband connections are eligible. Now, Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, air cards, and a combination thereof. Router and a modem, for instance, i.e., for in this instance, cradle points would be eligible on a school bus or for home use for multiple students, as an example. It's one Wi-Fi hotspot per users, all others one device per location, not per student. So if you have a family of five, a cradle point device would be eligible under that scenario for the all five students. And then laptops and notebooks are eligible with um, pricing limitations. Um, Self-provision networks are marginally eligible. We did not see a lot of this and we saw real problems with the applications um, for these. They're still getting extended out and have not been funded yet, uh, many of them. Um, things like, if you said your self-provision network was going to be located at your data center and you were going to propagate the signal from your data center and you pick that as your location, we've seen those denied, all right? So make sure that it makes sense in the context of what you're trying to accomplish and don't say that you're doing um, data distribution or Wi-Fi, you know, um, PLT from a data center on your campus, as an example, because that's not going to fly. What are the funding levels? So for connected devices, laptop computers and tablet computers, no desktop computers and no spares, 400 bucks each. Um, so again, Chromebooks, those kinds of things, all eligible with a $400 cap. Wi-Fi hotspots, 
are $250 at a cap. This is what makes this attractive for those multi-student and school buses, the modems and routers. The, um, devices that combine a modem and a router, there is no cap. And in school buses, device and connectivity, there is no cap. And then data plans, it's estimated at 10 to $25 per month, but no cap. We've seen pretty much they really start to question it when it gets over $40 per month. Um, beyond that point, they really, really start to hardball question on your application. <clears throat> so self-provision networks, again, very limited circumstances. I would suggest that you probably don't have time if you haven't already started the process to accomplish this. If you were for some reason not successful in your first go around in your application, um, tune it up. Uh, make sure that you have everything you need and your documentation ducks are in a row. Um, any tweaks that got you denied in the first place you can make and reapply. Um, but again, uh, I don't hold out, hold out a ton of hope for this, frankly. Um, will be scrutinized. My interpretation, um, heavily scrutinized, is a better interpretation. And again, must be implemented within one year of funding commitment decision and you have to demonstrate geographic and demographic coverage. In other words, those students in need, you have to determine where they live and why they need the connectivity from a geographic location and coverage standpoint. Miscellaneous stuff. Um, again, a 10 year documentation retention is a requirement. So any interaction you have with your service providers, you know, quotes, those kinds of things, make sure that you document that. The gift rule has been extended for gifts associated with distance learning. And I'll cover that in the fi final slide. Um, SIPA requirements will be in place when both device and connectivity are provided. User assigned credentials are required for access um, to the service. So in other words, um, if you have a student that's got internet access at home and you're supplying it, there's got to be some user assigned credentials to determine who the user is and how often they're using it. Um, Non-traditional off-campus locations are eligible where education is taking place. If you have a after-school um, care center that is um, supporting students after work, after school for homework uh, support, um, community center type of situation, boys and girls clubs where education is taking place, they're eligible. Um, and make, but again, that is not the um, after school club, you know, the, the fun club uh, for daycare after school on your existing campuses. And make sure you select the correct, correct type of product in your narrative and describe it in your narrative when you're doing the application. So there's different line items for product type or type of product in the 471 application under equipment. So there's two different types of application. There's a services application and, or FRN, funding request, or a equipment FRN. I'm suggesting that you divide those. And if, I were, if it were me doing the application, I would make two separate applications, one for service and one for the equipment. That way you will get funded probably much earlier in the process for the service. The equipment may take a little longer. That's been typical of the process, review process so far. And make sure you select the correct type of product. We saw a lot of difficulties where folks would put a Wi-Fi hotspot in when in fact they were applying for a cradle point. Or more commonly, they would put in for a modem and it would actually be a modem router combined for a bus um, and they would run into problems and get denied again. So, um, or strung along for a very long period of time, um, back and forth. And that, that is to be avoided at all costs if you can, because the minute that your application requires a back and forth with the reviewer, it's automatically like a 30 day delay in the process each time there is interaction. What happens? Sitting at the top of the pile, bubbles up to the top of the pile on the desk of the reviewer. Um, the reviewer takes a look at it, determines that there is some reason to interact with you, sends you a request for information or a 15-day letter, whatever you want to call it. And then um, once you respond to that, let's say that you take the full 15 days. Now the clock starts ticking again. Well, typically <clears throat> it does not bubble up to 
the reviewer's desk again for a couple of weeks. So now you're talking an automatic 30 day delay. Then they have to review it. Then it has to go back for further review or oh, your, your response required another question. Now back and forth again, suddenly you're 90 to 120 days delayed in your process. The more you can streamline this process, the more you can answer these questions up front in your narrative, um, in the application process, and um, really nail down what it is you're applying for, the better off you're going to be. Uh, gift rule suspension. Currently, the gift rule is, is extended through June 30th of 2022. I can tell you that um, organizations are already starting to ask for this extension again to make sure that there's no issues here. But currently, you can accept a gift from a service provider for broadband connectivity or distance learning applications uh, through June 20, 30th of 2022 with no um, things. This does not lift the gift rule waiver on personal things like um, the, the $50 per year, $20 in any single transaction between you and your service provider. Not an individual. You can't collect a 50 bucks from everybody in bite speed, but bite speed to you, $50 max in any single funding year. And last but not least, um, there's a whole bunch of um, initiatives going on. Obviously, the infrastructure bill did not get done through Congress, a scaled down version with $300 million additional funding for the ECF program. Um, there is still um, accessible, affordable Internet for All Act is still sitting out there. Um, these folks are still active in Congress, and this is still supported by the White House. Um, we'll see what happens after the midterm elections. Obviously, nothing's going to happen between now and November. But should the midterms um, remain um, as a Democratic uh, Congress and White House, we fully anticipate that this is going to get revisited. And we would encourage you to reach out um, to your Congress folks and make sure that they are aware that you support this. Um, that's the last bullet point. Um, we're still pushing for complete cybersecurity eligibility under the E-rate program, not ECF, but the E-rate program. There's enough money in the program. We've reviewed the filing uh, for this year. Again, there's plenty of money. There's 4.4 or $4.64 billion available in the E-rate program annually. It is not all getting utilized. There is funding available for this. And if you're interested, we would really encourage you to uh, reply um, and suggest that you can um, help with that process. Um, also, um, there is um, a, a um, competitive bidding window in the E-rate program. We would encourage you to look for any kind of survey or um, file a response to that. And then if you um, are looking for guides to help you find additional funding, there again is a tremendous amount of money out there. The um, uh, Department of um, Let's see, the Department of Treasury has a program, it's an application program for your state that goes up to the Department of Tre Treasury for $10 billion for local internet access and laying down infrastructure to support um, unmet needs for internet access. Uh, a, a, a bunch of them are out there. So again, um, if you're looking for a link to a guide, there it is. Now, really appreciate your time, wanna thank you. Um, I'm going to open this up for questions. Um, Anna, if, um, if there's some out there, I'm going to look at the chat myself and see what we got. Well, I can I can just shoot them over your way. One of the questions was, will this webinar be available to review after today? Um, the answer to that is yes. Everyone registered will receive the recording, and it will also be uploaded to www.bitespeed.com forward slash webinars. So anyone that wants to um, review the video would have the opportunity to do that later. Um, first question I'll throw you is, how is the modem router, router category different from the school bus category? What can we submit under the modem router category? Okay, so there is no school bus category. It is a modem router for a school bus. So again, that's covered in your narrative and under equipment type, um, then you state that your narrative states, I'm, this is for school buses, et cetera, et cetera. And then under the um, equipment type, it would be a, a modem router device. 
The next question is, if we participated in round one of ECF, but no need, new needs have arose, are we allowed to participate in round three? But yes. have new needs, excuse me. It, it, because this is extending the services for that you acquired for the devices in round one, um, let's say you completely covered, let's say you had 1500 students and round one covered through uh, July 1, 2023, but you still need that six months covered for the last six months of 2023. You could apply for that last six months of service. Thank you, Jim. Um, the next question is, how is USAC determining if there are sufficient cell phones on a bus for internet access? Urban areas may have better coverage than rural, but that does not mean that every student on the phone on the bus has a phone. Right, so um, you're not gonna, it's not for cell phone coverage. It is for internet access while you're on the school bus. So a Wi-Fi hotspot on the school bus that you supply to that student that does not have internet access, while on the school bus, that would be an unmet need. The next one is if you file a bear form, if you select bear form on the application, how easy is it to change to spy later? Not. <laughs> I I'll just reiterate that it can be done. You can do it, you can do a change. It does take some time. Um, I know a lot of schools that we worked with um, had selected the wrong one and had to go in and submit the changes and it can be done, just adds to that lead time. So I would definitely encourage you to know what your invoicing method is gonna be and make sure that if you're not personally filling out that paperwork, the person that's doing the paperwork for you knows which invoicing methods you would like to reference. So, okay, the next question, Jim, is we have an existing PLTE network. This request would have nothing to do with building it. We need additional routers for it. Would those be allowable based on your understanding as long as it also supports commercial LTE service or would it even have to do that? Um, yes, it is eligible if you needed additional routers for, or you know, devices to access that PLTE network and the student has an unmet need, absolutely eligible. Um, next question is, cradle point equipment for buses should be considered modem router combined. Are different solutions, different types in the available list? I'm not sure what you mean by what they mean by um, different types. So um, we'll go back um, to the list. Hold on. So here are the correct type of products available from the drop down menu. Dis again, there's a narrative ahead of this. Describe what you're purchasing in the narrative so that it's explicitly clear what it is that you're doing. These are cradle point devices for that are modem routers combined for school buses as an example <clears throat> so again um you know modems if these are you know cable modems um for a uh, home access kind of situation and that's what you're purchasing do that but again for um in the example of a school bus we found that um, item c modem router combined which is in the drop down menu for type of product and then describing it in a school, as a school bus modem router, and that you determine that there is an unmet need for that, that's the way to go. I actually ran into that with a lot of people too that weren't 100% sure how to um, select that one. Um, there's also a, a note about the funding deal that it's 100% uh, with the E-rate Okay, if I can read this right. It's still 100% funding, but the E-rate discount percentage determines who gets funded first and rural gets a 5% bonus. So 95% rural, then 90% urban, then 85% rural, then 80% urban, but everyone gets 100% paid for. So, and then I'll go. Um, and then just a note that said, thank you for the focus on unmet need and advocacy opportunities. Good job, Jim. I like reading that. And then can we apply for Chromebooks for school year 2023 or do we need to be, or do they need to be used right away? We're one-to-one -one for all students and order new ones for every year for first, fifth and ninth grade. Again, so just a blanket, um, we're gonna order them for all first graders kind of thing. The answer is no, this is for unmet needs student, unmet needs students. So if that student is coming on campus with an unmet need, and you need to purchase a Chromebook for them? The answer is yes. That's a tough one. 
Um, another question, we have not applied for round one or two. Will we be at a disadvantage? What are the biggest hurdles? Um, so there is no um, advantage or disadvantage based on when you have or have not applied. Um, again, the biggest hurdle is going to be if there's enough money in the round three. Okay. The next question is, how are the reimbursements distributed? Again, through what's called SAM.gov. Um, go back up here. Uh, <clears throat> here is the app. Here it is at SAM.gov. And the payments are, are System for Award Management, which is a federal government website. Um, and that's how they distribute the funding. So you need to register in that system. And once you've registered in that system and there is a payment, the payment will be made to you through SAM.gov, direct the bank account, direct deposit. All right. Uh, the next question is, if school, if school only did a portion of their buses on round one or two, are they eligible to complete their fleet and do the rest of their buses? Will the application be questioned because the first request was not for all the buses? My answer is, I'm not sure how much they're gonna compare last year's versus this year's kinds of applications. Um, the only, you know, that's a, that's a really good question and that's um, only USAC knows for sure. Our universal services administrative company that folks that govern and process this, these applications. Um, again, you're gonna to have to demonstrate unmet need. That's the, that's the key. If you can demonstrate unmet need for some reason, um, the question would be, well, why didn't you do it in round one? Here we are. But um, I'm not sure they're going to compare last year's versus this year's. So as long as you can demonstrate unmet need, I, th I would say it's fine. Yeah, I, I wouldn't think that they would. The other thing is, is you have a narrative so you can put um, finishing out the rest of our bus fleet mm -hmm. in the narrative and hopefully that would that would yeah. help. And the truth is, it probably depends on who your reviewer is. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, it's very, very true. Yeah. So um, the next question is outdoor Wi-Fi covered. For example, Ruckus Outdoor Wipe APs. Um, so this is not on campus. So an outdoor Wi-Fi router, <clears throat> or excuse me, AP. That, um, for instance, if you're doing this to cover a um, a, a, a campus. Uh, situation parking lot where you want parents to be able to come in and you know access the internet um, or students to come and download homework kind of thing as on a drive-by. Uh, no, it's not eligible because it's on campus. So the answer is uh, no, probably not. This is again for off-campus, after-school, um, or distance learning applications. So if a school applied for and received funding for hotspots in round one or two, will this impact their ability to get school bus Wi-Fi? No. Separate, two separate things. All right. And then can we submit three applications, bus Wi-Fi, hotspot service, hotspot device, in terms of the service, will it be for only one year or more? Um, so the service is for up to July 1, 2022 through December 31st, 2023. So 18 months. Um, so again, that's why I'm saying that um, if, if everybody applies and applied in round one for this extension of service, this money is going to go pretty darn quick. Um, that being said, you know, it's again, unmet need and um, separate, the, separate the applications because we all know that, you know, it's it may end up with a different reviewer. Um, processing is faster. Uh, who knows what the answer is really? If I had that crystal ball, I would be um, not doing this for a living anymore. I just, there is, I would recommend that you apply for all three on separate applications as a best practice. And that will get you, um, that will um, at least smooth over the easiest ones will get done first. And the harder ones with more questions will take longer and um, buy the service for the 18 months. Um, I'm going to just, this is kind of a reiterating when you probably just answer it. Could you please clarify data, data plan coverage requirements? Can plans be purchased prior to 1231-23 and have coverage that is provided after 1231-23? Thank you. Yes. Just answered that. Oh, no, no. For coverage after 
2023, there is no more service available. In other words, they're not gonna pay for service after that date. Now you may have a contract that extends, but the only payments you will be able to get are up until July, um, December 31, 2023. And again, it can be prepaid, but that's the, that's the last day of service for, under this program. So if you purchased four modem router for four school buses in round one, can you add more modem router for the rest of your buses? So that's already been answered. So yes, yes. you can, you've unmet me. So you, if you can demonstrate unmet need on the buses, then you're covered. How much licensing and services is covered? So three or five year, exam, for example, for Credo Points services. So bundled with the app, with the service, or bundled with the Cradle Point um, comes the licensing. We've seen three years funded. That's what I would recommend. I would not recommend five years. Um, again, <clears throat> um, be kind to your neighbors kind of situation. Um, if you're a high discount and uh, uh, I, I would suggest three years, put it that way. We've seen, we're, they've been funded, but make sure that you don't li um, line item out the licensing versus the device. In other words, one single line item that's like um, Cradle Point XYZ number 300 uh, to include licensing and, and um, support for three years. One line item. Awesome. I think we've gone through the questions. There's been some good chat conversation. One of the things that I'll just say to you guys is that every state has an E-rate resource, an E-rate coordinator. Um, if you're not working with a consultant, uh, find out who that person is and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, there's some really, really great people out there that are fantastic resources and really able to help when you're putting your applications together. Or if you have little questions as you start putting things in. I, I, I see the chat um, from Stephen and Melinda, and I just want to reiterate um, that uh, uh, the off-campus application is okay. On-campus is E-rate application process, completely separate application process. And certainly outdoor APs on a campus, on a school campus or on a library campus are eligible under E-rate, but not under ECF. All right. In fact, I don't think an, I don't think you could get an access point through the ECF program. Unless it was like a PLTE type tower receiver. Um. One of the next questions is we don't own our buses. What do we do? Um, I can I can take that one actually because we had some really significant success. So we have a portable um, bus kit that we've been using, which is a, it's a battery powered um, kit that you can kind of take on and off of the buses so that you're not doing a hard install on the buses, but you're still providing that bus wireless access. And that seems to have, um, that seems to have helped accommodate some of those issues where if you don't own the buses, you still have the ability to get bus Wi-Fi without um, causing issues with the company that you're leasing the buses through. And there's a um, kind of a second iteration on that. Well, there's three iterations that we've seen on school buses. The first is, you know, district owns their own buses or applicant owns the own bu their own buses. The same for, um, uh, you know, library uh, uh, mobiles, book mobiles. Um, you own them. You lease them from a different organization, um, negotiate the lease, uh, negotiate back into the lease that you have the ability to put that in. Um, fairly easy to do typically. Um, second scenario is you are, they're straight owned by somebody else and supported by somebody else and all you do is contract for bus services, portable devices. Um, sometimes, you know, if the buses are dedicated to your district, you can um, negotiate with that uh, loan company or that leasing company or the bus company. Third one is joint powers authority. Um, this is where multiple districts join together, smaller districts join together and share a school bus or transportation authority. We've seen that one as well. And then it's simply the um, joint powers authority applies as a consortium. And then the members um, uh, um, su are supported by that by a letter. They say, hey, I'm a member of this. So Here's, I'm applying under this joint powers authority application. And there you go, that's the third option. 
Oh, yeah, the next question is, does the state E-rate coordinator only help with E-rate applications? Is there an ECF coordinator by state? And I'll tell you that there is um, not an ECF coordinator by state, but um, like Mindy just said, most are doing it by default. I have not run into an E-rate coordinator that wasn't helping with ECF. So I apologize if you do run into one, but so far all of the, the ones that we've been engaged with have been helping with ECF as well. Um, I, um, I sit on a um, or, uh, sit on an organization as a, a member of that organization that all of the state E-rate coordinators attend on a regular basis. In fact, our E-rate um, coordination call um, and uh, uh, K-12 education call is coming up in a couple of hours. And I, I would say 90% of them are participating actively in that organization and are very up to speed on ECF. Um, one question I had too, boys and girls clubs, can they apply directly or does the school need to apply on their behalf? That's a really good question. If the boys or girls club is registered as an educational agency, then the answer is they can apply and they have to go through the same application process as everybody else. Um, they have to register with sam.gov. They have to re be registered in the portal. I would say that the likelihood of all of that happening is slim and none, frankly and that they should apply or get their school district to apply for them. All right. Are there any other questions before we let uh, Jim go about his day? Thank you so much, Jim, for spending some time with us today and answering those questions. And um, thank you for the people that were active in the chat uh, with the conversation and answering questions as well. Really appreciate all of you guys. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks all for listening. Take care. Thank you, guys. And good luck.